Hi guys, welcome to Cryptids Canada. I hope everybody's having a great day. So, um, just so you know, quite often I'll receive uh, an email asking me to forward on information to one of the storytellers or, uh, you know, if they found something interesting uh, and wanted their information passed on, then I will do the best that I can to do that. Well, last night I received an email from somebody who wanted their story told to the author of episode 137, Bigfoot in the Corn. The information that this person wanted passed on was so interesting. I asked if I could read it to you guys. At first, they said they weren't comfortable with that, but then relented and said, if I keep all the personal stuff to myself. So I'm going to read that email to you. Keep in mind, it was meant to be private or sorry, meant to to be for the person who wrote the story for our episode 137. So listen up. Hi, Leslie. I just heard the last episode with the hunter in the cornfield. I would like to talk to him, but if you don't want to give him my email, that's okay. Please tell him that what he heard mooing that turned into a scream may not have been a Bigfoot. I lived on a ranch that was in the wilderness. It was over 77 acres of pasture and forest that had a lake front. The lake is very secluded and people rarely go to it. It was very secluded and was surrounded by forest service and state land. So we didn't have neighbors close by. We heard these same loud mooing sounds that would fade into the most horrible screams of rage that made my dogs hide under my bed. Even the pig would burrow in under our house to hide. Once, after a full night of hearing these noises, we got up to find an awful scene in our back pasture. We found a deer carcass in the snow. It was ripped in half. The snow was covered in blood where the poor animal had died. The lower half of the carcass was missing. No drag marks, no fur scattered like when a wolf or a coyote attacked, and no signs of any kind of pack animals. What was in the snow was one set of extremely large canine prints. When I say one set, I mean there was one set. There was no front and rear prints in the snow. It was only two prints walking side by side like a human. The bottom half of the deer was missing, as if, whatever it was, picked up the half of the carcass and walked off with it on its shoulder. My son and I followed the prince off to where we could no longer get through the thick brush. The remainder of the deer was left untouched in the field until it decomposed. Even the crows and the coyotes didn't need it. I didn't know what it was, but eventually I met Vic Cundiff, and he told me it was most likely a dogman. I eventually moved away from the ranch, and now I live down the road. We continue to hear those horrible noises at least once or twice a month for four years until we moved. The closest neighbors down the road also heard the noises. I don't know if you have time to talk to him again, but if you do, you may want to tell him this. Vic told me that dogmen really like cornfields and are often found in them, the bed, he described, also sounds familiar to the structure we would find in the thick brush near our lake. He was very lucky if it was a dog man he encountered, because I don't think they're as nice as Bigfoot. Anyway, I heard your episode, and it was the first time I heard someone describe these noises, nearly identical as ours. We heard the moos in our neck of the woods. We don't have cattle nearby, but we do have packs of wolves. We thought it sounded like a deep alpha male wolf howling, and it would last about 10 seconds, only to fade into this deep guttural roar of absolute rage. Now that I think back on it, I suppose if someone had never heard a wolf, 
it would easily be mistaken for a cow mooing. After about a year of listening to these sounds in the darkness, I called a wildlife biology expert and had him come out at three in the morning and record them. He took the recording to the university and a professor there put the sounds through the database. He told me the noises did not fall into any category of North American animals. He also said that the lung capacity in decibels had to come from an animal that was the size of an elk or a moose. It was neither. Oh, and by the way, he also believes 100% in Sasquatch, Dogmen, and other cryptids. And then she goes on to give a little bit more detail about the town and so on and so forth. So I'm going to stop there because I'm afraid I might give up too much information. But I thought that was so amazing for somebody to just want to pass on some information. I love how you guys are interacting with each other. So thank you so much for taking your time to write that out and want that information passed on to the person who uh, sent in episode 137. Okay, guys, I have time for another one, I think. This one is titled Another Tale from Dale. <laughs> Hello, Leslie. Tis I again. My experiences vary and I'll share them in no particular order. This one is about an alien sighting out in our desert in a town named Desert Hot Springs. Years ago, we lived out in Palm Springs, California. We had just moved to the desert from the beach, and oh boy, was it ever hot. We had just bought a new house, and we were very excited about the move. Our house was located up in the foothills, and there were other homes around us, but also quite a few empty lots that hadn't been developed yet. Our place had a six-foot chain-link fence around the property. We had two Siberian Huskies that were named Tsar and Cleopatra that stayed outside most of the time. And that's before the animal lovers started hating on me for having furry snow dogs in the desert. Let me explain that the dogs had a very nice north-facing large patio area with fans and a water misting system to keep the patio cool. If you've ever heard a husky howl, their howl is like the closest thing to a wolf howl you will ever hear, and in itself can sound quite spooky depending on why the dog is howling. We had experienced in months prior, what sounded like someone or something landing on the roof of the house and running across the top from one end to the other. The house had those red Spanish tile shingles and they made a very distinct sound when you stepped on them. One evening, we were woken up by the dogs howling, only it was that spooky ass howl and it sounded scary. One of my brothers was staying with us and he was woken up too. There was a weird feeling in the air, and neither of us felt like exiting the house to look outside, so we were looking out the windows trying to see if we could spot what was setting the dogs off. I was on one side of the house, looking out the front windows, and he was looking out the sliding glass patio door that led to the backyard. All of a sudden, he started yelling, Dale, Dale, and was freaking out, so I ran over to him to look out the patio door. I didn't see anything, but he did. He told me he saw an alien walking up the gravel alley right behind the house, and it was a tall, gray alien about five feet tall. He got a very good look at it, but when he turned his head to call me over and then turned back, it was gone. Not all of my family believes my stories about the visitors, but some of them think I'm nuts. Some of them think I'm making it up for attention. And a few know it's 100% true. Not that my brother ever doubted me, but that night he learned for himself how real this shit is. Thank you for reading and sharing my wildlife with others. Many of us have been ridiculed and teased. Some of us suffer a form of PTSD from these things. To those of us who have had these things happen to us, giggles, we're not alone, Dale. P.S. I've read and heard a lot of people stating these things are fallen angels. 
Some are, however, many are not. Even the Bible that many of us read teaches us that only a fraction of angels fell with Lucifer. The rest did not. Angels and watchers are still doing their assigned tasks, helping us from their realm. Thank you, Dale. That was another great story. Um, and I hope that you'll keep sharing your stories with us because they uh, definitely do not fail to please for sure. Okay, guys, I think I have time for another really little one. But while I remember, I'm running out again. So if you guys would be kind enough to send me in your stories, you know, I would greatly appreciate it. Okay, on with the next one. This one is titled, My Bigfoot Encounter, and then Val in brackets. In 1972, my husband and I and our two little boys had just moved from California to Utah. One weekend, we decided to drive to Moab, Utah, and camp for the night. Not far above Moab, we turned into the entrance to Arches National Park and drove around looking at a beautiful red rock formations for about an hour and then headed back out on the access road to continue on to Moab. As we crested the top of the hill and began the long straight slope down the highway, around a quarter of a mile away was a pure black Bigfoot. Walking upright, crossing the road, and heading down the embankment on the other side. I was speechless and could not believe what I was seeing. This is desert, and everything was pale pink and brown and scrubby bushes that all sort of blended together in a pastel sort of landscape. And the Bigfoot was jet black and just stood out like a silhouette against the pale background. When we got to where it had disappeared down the bank, I asked my husband to please speed up because I was scared it might be hiding and jumping out at us in our little Volkswagen. It didn't and we got safely to Moab and never spoke about it ever again. That's my story. Thanks for reading it and thanks for your channel, Val. Well, thank you, Val. I appreciate it. You got right to the point. <laughs> no fanfare, just right to the point. Many people really enjoy that kind of a, an email. Anyways, guys, I think that that's going to be it for the night. Uh, I hope everybody had a great time and we'll see you back here in a couple of days. Bye for now.